Hey guys, welcome back. So today I wanted to talk about all things preserving and everything I use to preserve food, why I love it, why I use it. As we approach the gardening season, I think this would be very helpful. I am going to break this video up into different categories, freezing, fermenting, drying, canning, and then curing. These are the five different ways that I approach preserving food from my garden. Freezing is one of those that I really started to do right off the bat because I have a freezer. Most people have a freezer. You typically only need to make sure you have some freezer bags on hand. If you have a food saver, that is that much better. I personally don't have a food saver, but one thing I have found that have, has worked a lot better over the years than just throwing everything into a freezer bag is taking in the freezer bag and taking a straw and sucking out as much air as possible. This will help with any freezer burn and also double bagging. Anything that you throw in your freezer as well will also help with a longer term storage situation. Freezing is definitely probably the easiest thing you can approach when it comes to preserving your own food. And I thought it just deserved a mention right at the beginning because it's one of those that you don't need pretty much anything else than you would already have on hand. So now fermenting. I will say fermenting is one of those that I really didn't dabble in until the last few years just because I thought it was going to be more complicated than it really was. It's really not that complicated. You do need a food scale most of the time. That way you can make sure you have accurate ratios when it comes to your salt and water and things like that. So a food scale, salt, some jars, and then I like to use these weights. The, this will weigh down your food to make sure it's underneath the brine and this will just make sure that nothing ends up molding while it's being fermented in your space. The only things I have fermented are peppers for hot sauce and then cucumbers for pickles. So the next ones I'm approaching are definitely the ones I use most, which is drying, canning, and then also curing. These three are my staples and I do majority of all my preserving this way nowadays. So let's talk about drying. So when it comes to drying, I have three different methods and one of the methods is this herb hanger here. This will cost you roughly 15 to 20 dollars i have really enjoyed this over the years for different chamomile herbs um i will say this is not like an everything drying anything that's a little bit lower in moisture i will say i do not like this for basil um basil is just a little bit too moisture dense when it comes to the leaf anything that's drier such as rosemary thyme again your chamomile is a lot drier um Oh, like oregano is also a really good one, but this is just a really cheap, easy way that if you have a bunch of herbs that you're trying to dry all at one time, this is a very cheap and easy method to do that. And I've really, really liked this over the years. I actually prefer to use this over my dehydrator for most herbs, but you guys will see in a second that my freeze dryer has definitely overtook both these things. So one of my first ways I ever started to preserve food outside of freezing food was this dehydrator here. This is a very cheap dehydrator. I think it will range you like $30, $40. This is one my husband already had. So I have learned over the years, the dehydrators that stack like this, that have a heat source on the bottom are a little bit trickier when it comes to even heat like distribution. I will also say this one doesn't have any type of controls where I can control the heat. That is one reason why I really liked the hang dryer for a lot of my different herbs, just because I really noticed a color and flavor change when I compared the two over the years. This thing has worked amazing for chili flakes. Um, I still prefer this, especially for cayennes for chili flakes. This works amazing for chili flakes. I also use this for years to make my own paprika powder. I use this to dehydrate my basil a lot of the time, uh, my catnip a lot of the time. And overall, if you're looking for just a cheap way to preserve food, dehydrating is a great way. I will link everything down below that I do use. Um, that way you guys can easily check it out if you're interested. And then the last thing I use to dry food is my freeze dryer. Now this is my most new addition. This is definitely the highest price point item on this list, but hear me out. I have fell in love with freeze drying, especially because when I add up everything over the years that I have bought and used for canning, my freeze dryer is very equivalent to the same price. I can pretty much freeze dry everything and anything. It's a lot more beginner friendly outside of canning. Um, 
And honestly, you can make your own recipes. You're not having to follow canning recipes or anything like that. And I have just absolutely fell in love with the freeze dryer. I will say freeze dried herbs are by far my favorite. I love to freeze dry spinach too. I have a harvest right freeze dryer that is a medium size. So for me and my husband, I find this size to be really well. Honestly, it works great for my space. I will say during peak summer, it was running pretty much constantly for about a month's time with everything I was freeze drying. So if you have a bigger family or a bigger garden, I would almost suggest probably getting going up to a large, but for the most part, the medium works so well for me. And again, it's so beginner friendly. All you have to do is start it. It will typically tell you when you need to stop it. Sometimes you have to add a little bit more freeze dry time, but it, it takes the guesswork out of preserving. All you have to do is chop or prepare your vegetables like you typically would and you're able to just throw them in and forget about it you're not standing over a stove i think this is like by far my favorite method to preserve food it's definitely not the one that is the cheapest one other thing i like to have on hand when it comes to freeze drying food is mylar bags of course jars you can use either one but the one thing you really have to have on hand um is either a food saver that will suck out all of the air for you or oxygen absorbers. This will just make sure that there's no extra oxygen in the bag. So when it comes to drying a lot of things, I think having a salad spinner on hand is one of the best things. So yes, this can spin lettuce and get the extra moisture off, but it can also do this for all of your different herbs as well. So whether I'm dehydrating, using my herb hanger or using my freeze dryer, this thing became easily one of my most used items last year. I personally have never had a salad spinner until last year, and this was game changer. So if you're looking into drying some of your herbs or stuff like that, honestly, spend the $20 and get yourself a salad spinner. This will really cut down on that dry time. And again, I just find this so necessary and I'm so mad I did not have one for years. Now, canning is definitely my longest list when it comes to preserving food. I definitely have so many different things that have made my life easier while canning. So canning after dehydrating was something I jumped into. I started with water bath canning and I did that for about a year to kind of make sure that like, I didn't absolutely hate canning, which I will say, if you're not used to spending hours in the kitchen, canning can really feel like a struggle initially. I have learned to love it over the years. I used to think it was very hard. <laughs> and when I first got into canning, just because I was not used to spending three to eight hours preserving something, it really took me a few years to really enjoy canning for what it is. So keep that in mind. And that's one reason why I say the freeze dryer is so beginner friendly because you're not having to read recipes, you're not having to stand over a stove, you're not having to clean a million things. Yes, you have to be sanitary no matter what you're preserving, but canning is a whole other level. So if you're trying to get into canning though, I highly suggest this book. This is the Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving. This has been a staple. My binding is really starting to go to crap at this point because I love this book so much. It really breaks down a ton of different water bath canning. It also breaks down everything you need to know for pressure canning. And again, this has been my staple book. Everything I've really needed to know with canning has come from this book. And I highly suggest having this on hand. It has some of my favorite salsa recipes as well. So I uh, really love this book. Let me find the salsa recipe. The fresh vegetable salsa rest recipe on page 201 if you have this book or if you get this book. I love this recipe so much. It's really customizable. So for instance, when it comes to one cup of green bell peppers, you can exchange that for one cup of say serranos and jalapenos and make a little bit more of a spicy salsa. So that's one thing I like. It gives you those um, little tips that if you don't mind heat, you can exchange certain things out and it just tells you that on the side. So again, love this book. If you're getting into canning, highly, highly suggest this has been a lifesaver for me. A few of the other really basic things when it comes to canning is you do want to have a mason jar funnel of some sorts. I really want to get a stainless steel one of these, but this came in a really cheap, I think, Presto canning kit. This is a debubbler, which you will make sure you get all the air bubbles out of your jar before you throw it in the canner. That way 
your head space is correct. Um, but this has a magnet on the bottom that you can easily pick up your lids and place them onto the jar, which I really like. Again, the funnel. And then this is um, jar tongs. This is a must if you are canning. This will help you get your jars out of the hot, steamy water bath or pressure canner safely. And then the other thing I really like to have on hand is this silicone mat. So this silicone mat right here just helps heat stay off of my counter. It also is really nice just to lay a towel over it and then I can put my hot jar on it, fill the jar up. This is also really nice uh, once you get all of your jars out of your canner for them to rest on your counter. I have wood countertops, so I obviously cannot put heat directly on those countertops, which I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to put heat on most countertops. Um, but I really like having this little silicone mat. It's been very handy. I can also put it over my sink and that way when I'm sanitizing like lids or jars or anything like that, I have a space that is sanitary off of my sink and this just works really well. I really like having this on hand. When it comes to water bath canning, I have this one and I have this one here. So stock pots are amazing. I believe this is a 50 or 40 quart stock pot. And I really enjoy having two of these on hand, especially for sauce making days, or if I'm making one, or if I'm making something in one, and then I have another pot where I can go ahead and water bath can. So you can go to your local Asian grocery store. That's where I found this one. And typically you can find these stock pots for a hell of a deal compared to what you can find online. So this one's really cool because it has a built-in rack. So one thing you have to worry about when you're doing any type of canning is to make sure your jars don't sit on the bottom of your canner just because that can make them rattle and crack and it's just not good. So you want to have them off. Uh, this one's a bit more expensive. I think this one ranges from like 50 to 70 from when I've looked at it over the years. But again, having just, an, you don't need a water bath canner. They do make canners that are just for water bath canning, but I found a big sock pot just to be the one thing you need. So when it comes to water bath canning, you do need to make sure you have at least an inch of water above your jar. So that's why I have such a large stock pot because uh, my quart jar, once like say my rack goes to be about right here, then I have a quart jar that's probably right at this level. And then I need an inch of water above that. So this really, this size really allows me to have everything in there. I can do about seven to eight jars. I believe I can do eight jars in this one and seven jars in this one quart wise. But again, a stock pot is just very, very good to have on hand. And if you're trying to get into canning, definitely suggest giving water bath canning a try before you jump into pressure canning. All right, so let's talk about the one and only pressure canner. So this is my all American pressure canner. Gosh, I am drawing a blank on the size at the moment. I'll put it across the screen. I love this thing. So I was a little hesitant like anyone is jumping into pressure canning just because there's there's obviously a warning label right on front of it. And I'm sure you've seen the horror stories of people's pressure canners exploding. As long as you do everything correctly, which isn't many steps, you are going to be just fine. So I love my All American. This is definitely one of the more elite pressure canners out there. I believe Presto makes one for roughly like 150. This guy, I think I bought it for about 400. Um, but I think they've gone up over the years. I could definitely use another pressure canner. Um, pressure canning does take a little bit more time, but if you're wanting to do any type of broth making, I love my pressure canner. And the more I use my pressure canner, the more I love it over my water bath canner. Because when it comes to water bath canning, you typically need to add um, vinegar to certain things to make sure the, acidi the acidity levels are where they need to be to be safe. But when it comes to pressure canning, say I wanna pressure can carrots. I don't have to add anything to that. I can slice up the carrots, add some water, pressure can them. So I personally use my pressure canner mostly for broth and tomato products. I have done a handful of different things through the years where I'm making like beef stew or chicken soup, um, things like that. So when it comes to like your canned meals, so like meals in a jar, you will definitely need a pressure canner, but I have really loved this. When it comes to my pressure canner, I have a glass top stove, which um, a lot of times pressure canners are advised not to be used on a glass top stove. At least I believe my All American 
isn't, I think the Presto is different. So take this with a grain of salt. But one thing I have when it comes to canning is a camp stove. So a camp stove for me has been so nice because especially if I'm canning for six to eight hours, the last thing I want to do in the dead of summer is make my kitchen that much hotter. So my camp stove is just so nice because it's outside, it uses propane. Um, this I can't even fit on my stove top because my microwave sits a little bit too low. So that's something we're actually kind of figuring out now it's, is we're looking at different stove top ranges. We bought this one secondhand for like $100 and I've thought that I've wanted gas, but if I get a gas stove, I still wouldn't be able to use my pressure canner inside because my microwave sits too low and I can't even fit this. So that is one thing. This thing is tall, it's hefty, but I love my camp stove and I use my camp stove all the time when it comes to canning. You will also see people advise you not to use camp stoves and that can be because um, say like a big gust of wind comes through and then it can change your heat levels. I personally have never had a problem and I live in Kansas, so just FYI. <laughs> but yeah, when it comes to pressure canning, I also use my camp stove every single time. So it's one of those things that I do use quite often and I absolutely love. This is my tomato press. So tomato presses come in a whole a range of different prices. Some are electric, some are not. Mine is an electric one. It's an Italian one. I have loved this thing so much. So let me pull it out of the box and show you. So I will say when we were looking up tomato presses, at this point, I already knew I wanted to make sauce every year. So I went ahead and splurged a bit. I wanted a tomato press that didn't have a bunch of plastic parts that could easily break. I wanted something that would literally last my lifetime. So this one here is definitely heavy duty but I love it. So a tomato press is one of those items that I only use for tomatoes, but say I get an apple tree one day, um, I could easily use this for applesauce as well. So it just sets up pretty easily like this. So what you do is I feed my tomatoes through this. This is the one plastic piece just to help push it through. And what it does is it de-seeds and de-skins all of your tomatoes, which if you are making tomato sauce, let me tell you how much time this saves me. The very first time I ever processed tomatoes, I think I was de-seeding and skinning my tomatoes for literally hours. It took so long. This thing can process like 30 to 40 pounds of tomatoes within like 10 minutes. It's so fast. I get a super smooth sauce out of this. And again, like I'm so excited one day to have an apple tree and to make applesauce with this as well. This is definitely one of those like very particular items that I don't use for everything, but I have had it for four years now. And it's one of my absolute favorite things because it makes my life so much easier. So another not necessary item, but makes my life significantly easier while canning item is this roaster. So roasters are so great if you're trying to cook anything down. So think again, tomatoes, or um, if you have broth going and you're trying to do bone broth, Wow, this is so nice. This is also just really nice because again, I don't have a ton of space in my kitchen. I would personally love to have a six to eight burner stove top. I don't. So this really just allows me to have something else off to the side that isn't on my stove. This was one of those items that I always heard people talk about and I was like, okay, that's not necessary. I'm not gonna spend $100 on that. These things go on sale quite often, so definitely keep an eye on them but I found this thing just to be one of those items that I honestly can't live without if I'm canning, especially broths. It just makes my life so much easier. I'm not having to stand on top of the stove constantly. I'm able to throw stuff in here, keep it at a certain temp, keep an eye on it from time to time, but I'm definitely not having to keep an eye on it as much as I would if it was just in a stock pot. Last but not least, whoops, when it comes to canning, is just some of the items I like to have on hand when it comes to canning. So obviously you need jars. <laughs> so having jars on hand is definitely needed if you're canning. Having extra lids is also one of those things that 
just have extra lids on hand. I also have citric acid on hand when it comes to making tomato sauce and other products, having pectin on hand if you're trying to make any types of jams and jelly, having a 5% vinegar. Um, you'll be amazed on how much vinegar you go through because even if I'm not using vinegar in a recipe, one thing that really helps me because I have hard water here. So when it comes to any type of canning, especially pressure canning, I like to add a few tablespoons of vinegar to my water that's in my stock pots or my pressure canner. And that will make sure your um, jars don't get cloudy. Um, I have done it in the past where I will randomly forget to add vinegar and my jars will be super cloudy. And then if that happens, if you forget, you can just take a warm washcloth with a little bit of vinegar and wipe the edges off then. But yeah, other than, all of that the other thing I actually really like to have on hand when canning is this white table here that I'm currently using so this actually is just one of those fold-out tables this comes in handy when I'm doing anything like my tomato press I like to press my tomatoes outside because it can be a little bit more messy this is also really nice to have on hand if you're washing a ton of dishes because canning equals a lot of dishes, especially these stock pots and things like that. So if I can put this out of the way, put a few towels on it, wash a bunch of dishes, it keeps things out of the way. I'm actually shocked on how much I use this fold out table for canning days. I use it so often. So if you're like me and you are in a smaller kitchen, um, look for a fold out table. Another thing I would suggest to start looking at is your local estate auctions. Sometimes you can find some really nice pressure canners. You can find jars for a steel and other canning items for a steel. So definitely keep an eye out on your estate auctions because you can find some amazing things. Oh, another thing. So when it comes to those roasters, I see those roasters all the time on estate auctions. There's probably a ton of friends and family that have these roasters. They use them maybe once a year for Thanksgiving, or they may have something on hand that you're looking for as far as like jars or canning lids or even canners or big stock pots that you may not need to buy initially, or they might just give it to you. That is another big thing. So I would definitely shoot out to friends and family because sometimes people get into this and they immediately stop once they realize like, it is quite a bit of work. All right, and lastly, curing. So curing is one of those things that I do for garlic, onions, and also potatoes. And I use my garage mostly when it comes to this curing process. I do make sure I have about two to three fans going in this room at all times for good airflow. But I did create a system to where if you're, again, in a smaller area like me and you're unsure of where you're going to cure some of these items, my garlic has done so well like this for the last, what, three, three years, I believe at this point. We put two by fours on the wall of our garage and then we lined that with cattle panels and it allows me to hang bunches of like six to eight garlics like kind of flat. I can hang them all up on my wall and that allows everything to be off the ground. It also can circulate air really, really well. Um, and then when it comes to onions and potatoes, this was something I kind of had to figure out last minute last year because I had so many onions that did so well to where we built a like curing shelf with chicken wire and a bunch of random wood we had on hand. All of these Pretty much both of these were thrown together with just random stuff we had on hand. But when it comes to curing, so a curing process is about four weeks or so. And curing, what it does is just dry out that outer portion and it really helps your uh, vegetables last that much longer. I think that actually sums up everything I used to preserve food. I really hope I didn't miss anything on there. I was really trying to put a list together and go through everything this week to make sure I didn't miss anything. But if you have any questions, feel free to leave them below. I know how confusing the world of preserving can truly be. Again, start small, start with freezing, start with drying, maybe dabble a little bit into water back canning because water back canning, Again, you can typically find a stock pot for fairly cheap and you don't need a lot of items to do that. Just know you can do this on a small scale. I grew into all of this. If I had to pick a favorite, honestly, my freeze dryer is my favorite. My second favorite is probably my pressure canner, which again are the two most expensive items, but those are like the two items I got last uh, once I knew I really liked this lifestyle. But I hope today's video helped you out. Again, I will make sure I link everything in the description box for you guys. And if you have any questions, please leave them down below. Thanks for joining me today. I'll see you guys all in the next one. Bye.